Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the December 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of The Middle Peasants by Lenin from 1919. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this was first recorded by Lenin as a speech on gramophone in March 1919, First published according to the Gramophone Records, the source is Lenin's Collected Works, 4th English Edition, Progress Publishers, Moscow, 1972, translated by George Hanna, HTML Transcription and Markup, by David Walters and Robert Cimbala. It's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. So for historical context, this is about a year and a half after the Russian Revolution in late 1917. The new communist-led government was out to stabilize the country and consolidate the alliance between the proletariat in the leading position and the peasantry. So let's begin. The most important question now confronting the Communist Party, the question on which most attention was concentrated at the last party congress, is that of the middle peasants. Naturally, the first question usually asked is, what is a middle peasant? Naturally, party comrades have often related how they have been asked this question in the villages. The middle peasant, we say in reply, is a peasant who does not exploit the labor of others, who does not live on the labor of others, who does not take the fruits of other people's labor in any shape or form, but works himself and lives by his own labor. Under capitalism, there were fewer peasants of this type than there are now, because the majority of the peasants were in the ranks of the impoverished, and only an insignificant minority, then as now, were in the ranks of the kulaks, the exploiters, the rich peasants. The middle peasants have been increasing in number since the private ownership of land was abolished, and the Soviet government has firmly resolved at all costs to establish relations of complete peace and harmony with them. It goes without saying that the middle peasant cannot immediately accept socialism, because he clings firmly to what he's accustomed to, he's cautious about all innovations, subjects what he's offered to a factual, practical test, and does not decide to change his way of life until he's convinced that that change is necessary. It's precisely for this reason that we must know, remember, and put into practice the rule that when communist workers go into rural districts, they must try to establish comradely relations with the middle peasants. It is their duty to establish these comradely relations with them. They must remember that working peasants who do not exploit the labor of others are the comrades of the urban workers, and that we can and must establish with them a voluntary alliance inspired by sincerity and confidence. Every measure proposed by the communist government must be regarded merely as advice, as a suggestion to the middle peasants, as an invitation to them to accept the new order. Only in cooperation in the work of testing these measures in practice, finding out in what way they're mistaken, eliminating possible errors, and achieving agreement with the middle peasant, only by such cooperation can the alliance between the workers and the peasants be ensured. This alliance is the main strength and the bulwark of Soviet power. This alliance is a pledge that socialist transformation will be successful, victory over capital will be achieved, and exploitation in all its forms will be abolished. So that's the end of the short gramophone recorded speech, pretty much directly to the point. Um, you may, if you're very new to the subject matter, not be familiar with the distinction between poor peasants, middle peasants, and rich peasants. Actually, if you read Mao, he breaks it down even further in the analysis of Chinese society. You can see texts like analysis of the classes in Chinese society for a longer example, or how to differentiate the classes in the rural areas for a shorter example. We have both of those as audiobooks here at the channel or on the SoundCloud. All right, so there you have it. Now let's turn to the actual gramophone recording of Lenin giving this speech. Задается обыкновенно, что такое крестьянин среди дня. Естественно, что партийные товарищи рассказывали не раз, как в деревне и спрашивали, кто такой среди дня. И на этом мы отвечаем, 
Через мяк это такой крестьянин, который не эксплуатирует чужого труда, не живет чужим трудом, не пользуется ни в какой мере, ни коим образом плодами чужого труда, а работает там, живет собственным трудом. Таких крестьян было меньше, чем теперь при капитализме, потому что большинство принадлежало к совсем нуждающимся, и только ничтожное меньшинство, как тогда, так и теперь, принадлежало к кулакам, к эксплуататорам, к богатым крестьянам. Средних крестьян становится больше после того, как отменена частная собственность на землю. И вот со средним крестьянином советская власть твердо решила, во что бы то ни стало установить отношения полного мира и согласия. Понятно, что средний крестьянин не может сразу встать на сторону социализма, потому что он твердо стоит на том, к чему привык, осторожно относится ко всяким новшествам, проверяет сначала делом, практикой то, чему его зовут, не решается изменить свою жизнь, пока не убедится в том, что это изменение необходимо. Именно поэтому мы должны знать и помнить и проводить жизнь с рабочие коммунисты, появляющиеся в деревне, обязаны искать товарищеских отношений с средним крестьянам, обязаны устанавливать товарищеские отношения к ним, обязаны помнить, что трудящийся, который не эксплуатирует чужого труда, есть товарищ рабочего, и с ним можно и должно достигнуть добровольного, полного искренности, полного доверия Союза. На всяческие меры, которые предлагает коммунистическая власть, надо смотреть таким образом, что они являются лишь советом, указанием среднему крестьянину, предложением ему перейти к новому порядку. И только совместной работой, испытывающей эти мероприятия на практике, проверяющие их ошибки, устраняющие возможные ошибки, достигающие соглашения с средним крестьянином, только такой работой будет обеспечен союз рабочих и крестьян. В этом союзе вся главная сила и опора советской власти. В этом союзе залог того, что дело социалистического преобразования, дело победы.